Curtis E. Hansen, United States Navy, World War II, D-Day. Today is June 6th, folks, 2023, 79 years ago. This day was the beginning of end for Germany and the Nazi regime. Curtis Hansen served with the United States Navy with the amphibious forces, trained with the 1st Division and the 29th Infantry Division on Slapton Sands in England before the invasion. Tells a great story. One of my first and most dearest, fondest interviews over 20 years ago, March 25th, 2003, Phoenix, Arizona. I met Curtis and his wife, Muriel. Curtis has been gone for 12, 13 years now, passed away in 2011, is buried at Fort Snelling National Cemetery in Minnesota. I just love this man. I love his story. I'm so happy to be able to share it with you today on D-Day. This is a special edition of Voices of History. Thank you to Brandon Glidden for sponsoring this story. Brandon, thank you. God bless you. I love you, sir. Thank you for your dedication to our service members, to our veterans, and on this special day as we remember the Normandy invasion on D-Day. God bless you, Brandon. Thank you. Folks, Curtis's story, like I said, is gripping. It's, it's from the Navy perspective. He tells a great story of the Higgins boats uh, that Andrew Jackson Higgins manufactured from Louisiana during World War II. The LCVPs that took our troops into shore that landed them like the helicopters landed troops in Vietnam. The LCVPs of the day in the Pacific and in Europe. So he tells a great story of the amphibious forces, how they formed a line like a gee, like a V, like the geese do in the sky, and they went into shore. And it just tells a great story um, on one of those boats as an ensign. So God bless Curtis Hansen, his memory, and his family as we celebrate D Day today, Omaha, Be Omaha Beach. Americans also landed on Utah Beach, the British landed on Golden Sword Beaches, and the Canadians landed on Juneau Beach on D-Day. I've been to France three times. I was there 20 years ago right now doing a, an interview into my camera like I'm doing right now as it was in the evening there in France at that time. So just so many memories today and got both flags flag, flying today at my home here. Remembering, most all my D-Day veterans are gone now, folks, and uh, the work's become very bittersweet, but I'm encouraged by how many of you are seeing the importance of getting these stories out. So I'm glad to share Curtis's story today. Folks, if you'd like to sponsor a story, there's information in the video description on my website. If you'd like to donate, there's information in the comment section. So God bless you. Happy D-Day. Happy Omaha Beach Day. The first love of my work. Um, as I'm very reflective today and happy to share this story for the first time on Voices of History. And watch my Omaha Beach documentary. The link's at the end of this video. God bless you. But introduce yourself to the, to me, and just tell me again. You were in the Navy, and what your rank, or your, and I don't know in the Navy if it's called divisions or groups, or tell me, you know, what part of the Navy you were with when you were in World War II. Go ahead. Okay, my name is Kurt Hansen, uh, from Minneapolis. Uh, I was an ensign in the Navy, given an instant commission, graduate of Saint Olaf College, and I had taught school for one year, and. Um, uh, I was then sent to officers training school in uh, New York and from there on to uh, Little Creek, Virginia that was the school for amphibious boats. Um, I could say a word about amphibious boats. They were, I think, m so marvelously made. They were made by Higgins in, in New Orleans. They had a 300 horse gray marine engine in them. We had about 3 8 inch um, 
armor plate around the side. They were 36 feet long, about eight feet wide, five and a half feet tall, had a ramp. It took four men to run the boat. The coxswain was the driver. Uh, the ramp man pulled the trigger that lowered the ramp and, the, and two machine gunners in the back. Um, I was uh, assigned, uh, and my, I had a crew of three, three crews of four men each, and uh, we also trained after the officers learned how to run the boats, then we were assigned 12 men. We made three crews of each of four of them to, uh, and I taught them all all the positions so that everybody would know in case something would happen to, to anyone. We were from uh, Little Creek, we went to Fort Pierce, Florida to a ranger camp. And at that, I'm, I may be dumb, but I'm not stupid. And at that point, I knew that we were in for something big. And we were then shipped to England. We trained with the 1st and 29th Division and a place called Slapton Sands was a very a common place we used to hit and uh, discharge our men. We got, uh, we didn't know them by name, but we got to recognize the fellows by face uh, that we had taken ashore and we'd, we would um, pull up alongside of a ship and they'd come climbing down their rope ladders and, and uh, get on board and we'd take them ashore and and um, then on, I think, the 2nd of June, 1944, a small boat came alongside of our, of our ship, and they asked for me, and I went. They had an MP, military policeman, in the, in the uh, small boat, and they dropped us off. I think it was Plymouth, but I'm not, I'm not sure. And we were taken to a... a, a it had been a bombed out um, movie theater that had been redone and there were about 60 or 70 of us in there and when we hit the door we gave our name and they gave us an envelope and in there was our, our order for uh, D-Day and I was to hit uh, dog, the Dog Red sector of Omaha Beach. And they had, uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we recognized it when we got there. They had remodeled the top of Slapton Sands with a bulldozer, so it had the same general shape as Omaha Beach. And, and then the, uh, the major that was uh, briefing us said, uh, if you see fire on the water, don't hesitate one second. Turn around and go back to sea as fast as you can go. So somebody asked why. The Germans had either three or four four-inch pipelines that, with pump stations from the top of Omaha and that would go out a couple of hundred yards in the ocean. They were going to pump gasoline or fuel oil through that pipe out there and um, then they'd fire a tracer bullet, uh, the, the gas being lighter than water, it would rise to the top, they were going to fire a tracer bullet in it, and the ocean would catch on fire and burn everybody. And this was one of their um, anti-invasion um, obstacles that they had. So somebody behind, I remember a gentleman right behind me said, uh, what, what is the government doing to take care of this? He said, the French underground is going to take care of all of those Germans and the pump stations and smash the pumps. Okay, what happens if, what, what, what will, will be if the French do not make it because they had taken away all their guns and their knives and but they had a, uh, I think it's called a giro, and it's about a four inch, a four foot long piece of piano wire with a toggle on each end, and they would make a loop and put that over the German's head, put their knee in their back and give one pull and would decapitate them. And to make a long story short, 
uh, we never had any fire on the water, so the French underground did their job. And somebody uh, had asked the major, said, uh, what happens if, if, they, uh, if the Germans shoot the Frenchmen first? He said, don't worry, there are several backups for each, for each group. So um, uh, that happened, and the French underground did take care of the Germans, and um, also uh, broke the pump stations, so they couldn't uh, couldn't fire, uh, couldn't uh, put their gasoline down in the water. And somebody had mentioned the 352nd. This is a German division that was camped right on the top of Omaha Beach. And our intelligence knew about it, but they only moved there a day or two ahead of the invasion. And so there wasn't time to um, do anything about it except the air, airplanes that came over were supposed to have bombed and killed a lot of the 10,000 men that were there. But uh, it was cloudy that morning and rain and some somebody missed the boat and they they bombed about a mile and a half in and so the this German division of 10,000 men had not been touched and they laid over the top of Omaha Beach like shooting at us like rats were shooting at a you know, like you're shooting rats at a dump. Um, I took the first general ashore that went ashore by a small boat that I know of General Charles Gerhardt, he just passed away a couple of years ago in Florida, and he was of the a general in the 29th Division, and he wore two pearl-handled revolvers. I think he was trying to emulate Patton, and we started into the beach, and it got real heavy. Uh, the firing got real heavy in the area where we were supposed to land, so I told the coxswain to turn the boat around, and we'd go back out and... and um, uh, look it over, and uh, the gen the uh, general came to me and started really giving me the word. Uh, I thought I knew most of the curse words, but the, he taught me a few that day. And um, I, but we had been told in our training that uh, don't ever let a superior officer tell you what to do. And so I said to him, General, I'm in charge of this boat until we hit the beach and then you take over. He said, you're absolutely right, Ensign. And he, he backed off and we waited about 20 minutes and took him in. Shortly after that, we were hit by a German 88 and sunk. And we swam ashore. The three of us that were left swam ashore and, and uh, laid behind the Tetrahedons, kept moving with the tide and almost froze to death and until the beach was finally secured sometime after, after lunch. And we were then picked up the next day um, and taken back to England to a survivor camp and uh, given new clothes and, and um, I think they gave us $100. I've forgotten now what, what it was to, to uh, and then sent back to the ship and so I stayed then on the on the LST, which was our mothership, <clears throat> and uh, went back and f and hauled um, supplies back and forth to, from England then to to France um, until the middle of December when we turned the ship over to the British and came home. Um, Here's what I want to do now. We skipped over some of this stuff. Okay, let's go back to the Omaha Beach landing. And now, did you debark from a Bane ship? Or were you in a holding pattern, picking up soldiers, getting off on the, the nets, coming down the nets into the LCBD? Okay. Okay, slow it down for me now. Let's, let me visualize this. Okay, let's go back in your mind. Tell me about the soldiers. Tell me about that the sea was rough, if they're having a hard time getting into that boat. And then tell me about your trip to shore. I want to hear a, sl a little slower version of that because I know there were some other things and what was going on. But let's start from there, coming down the nets and stuff. Okay. Start well, I started at midnight. We had our last breakfast. And there you could have anything you wanted, uh, steak, uh, bacon, eggs, potatoes, anything. And uh, then after that, we got dressed in impregnated underwear 
which was long, they were long johns that had been soaked in lye. And the reason for this was in case the Germans would um, pull a, 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 a mustard gas raid, this was to protect us, uh, to protect our bodies. I have a copy of the ship's log that says uh, at 0342, 342 in the morning, our small boat left our uh, LST. We were anchored seven miles from shore and uh, uh, we left the uh, the beach at, left the ship at 3.42 in the morning and then uh, the soldiers climbed down the rope ladders and into our boat. One of them uh, slipped and fell between the boat and the ship and broke a leg and so he didn't have to go ashore. But um, uh, then after we had about 45 to 50 men in the, in the small boat, uh, I circled and my orders were to circle the bow of the LST 316, 316. I was on the LST 315 and the LST 316, we circled for, I don't know, an hour, maybe an hour and a half until 15, we had 15 boats. And of course, uh, it was rough, six and eight foot waves, and the soldiers were, got seasick and vomited. In fact, the, the bottom of the boat was so full of vomit, you could hardly stand up. And so they'd reach over the, over the side with their helmets and take a, a helmet full of water and, and to wash it down and we had excellent bilge pumps on those boats and that would pump the mix up the vomit and the water and pump it back over the side and then uh, I, and I don't remember exactly what time but our our wave was to land on dog red sector of Omaha Beach at 10 minutes to 7 6:30 was H hour and we were to land the third wave at 10 minutes to 7 and so we started in about, I think, 50 minutes maybe ahead of them, ahead of that time. <clears throat> and um, uh, the, the top of the beach had been, as I said before, had been remodeled. So it looked like uh, we could see the shape of the beach. And, and I was really quite close to, to the dog red sector. I know there were many boats that went off, uh, but they hadn't practiced that much at Slapton Sands. And I don't think we were told at Slapton Sands that that was to be there, but uh, uh, I just had kind of figured it out that that would be one of the ways to, uh, to uh, look. And so we drew, and uh, when we practiced at Fort Pierce, we also had six foot waves down there and we, as much as we cursed the, the, the waves every day, they were a blessing when we got to Omaha Beach because we knew then what, how to handle the boat. And we hit the beach and uh, uh, the coxswain turned the boat a little bit to the starboard and that let it be that, that uh, the Germans couldn't shoot directly into the boat. And so we probably got more men ashore that way than, than um, uh, had we stayed head on all the time. And um, Tell me about that. I mean, you've approached shore. Tell me, about, okay, first of all, tell me about the men in the boat. I mean, were they praying? Were they quiet? Were they sitting down? Were they standing up? What was the mood on that boat before you, the ramp went down? Were you taking fire on the sea? I mean... Tell me about it. We, um, to start with, we could hear the uh, battleships shells going over our head. It sounded like a freight train. Mm -hmm. And these big 12 and 14 inch shells were going over our head. And they stopped firing on the beach very shortly before we, before we quit, before, before we hit the beach. Um, I don't know that 
we knew what was really going to happen. So I don't think the men were as, we knew we had a job to do. Uh, I don't think we, we were really that much afraid. They were more seasick than, than they were afraid. And of course, um, uh, that didn't bother us sailors that much because we'd been in on all kinds of that, uh, that kind of stuff. But the, uh, the, they, were, they were concerned about what they would find when they got to the beach, but I don't know that they were that... Uh, uh, maybe a few were praying, um, but they were mostly sick, sick, sick. And just if they could get off that boat, they were, they were going to be uh, happy people. Um, we also, um, they, they used ducks quite a bit. And the, the water was so rough that the ducks went, uh, went to the bottom. And the, the soldiers that were on there were either not informed correctly or were, or were informed incorrectly. They wore an inflatable life jacket and they wore it underneath their packet in the back. And so they'd squeeze the CO2 cartridges and they'd float bottom up and drown. And we pulled many men, I don't know how many, 15 maybe, out of the water that were strong enough to get a knife out of their boot or wherever they kept them and cut their packs off and they were floating with their helmets and they dropped their rifles, of course, and everything. And we took them back and put them on a destroyer. But there were so many men in the water that I, the, the, the ramp man had to act as a, as a telegraph person and tell the coxswain which way to turn the boat not to run over the dead that were floating in the water. So um, there was that kind of uh, concern as well. And then after we were, we were sunk, we swam ashore and laid there until the beach was taken. That's, um, so now when you said three of you made it off that boat when it was hit with the 88, were there others on the boat that didn't make it off? Didn't make it. Two of them didn't make it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So most everybody was off the boat before it was hit. They, that's right. We were empty when we were hit. Okay. And um, it's interesting what you said about the coxswain maneuvering that boat. I haven't heard that before. I heard that there were bodies floating in the water, but not what you just said. That's pretty interesting. That. So he would so tell the coxswain which way to turn. So they... Because we didn't want to chew up the bodies. And, and also it would raise cane with our propeller would break the propeller and then that would be the end of the boat. Now, you obviously weren't trained for what you saw, I mean, the dead bodies and all that. I mean, how do you, how do you stay focused on your mission or, or do you? I mean, does that distract you? Does that, are you stopping? And you probably didn't really think about it until after it was over with, but I, I, what was your state of mind during all that? I mean, <laughs> best you can explain. I, 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 I don't know, really. Um, you think that's a part of what is going to happen. They train you so that, really they train you so you think something is going to happen to you. And this is why that fire in the water really concerned me, because I didn't want to burn to death. We had uh, 500 gallons of fuel oil and thousands of rounds of ammunition that would make a, a pretty big boom uh, when it went off. So, uh, um, you were trained, and I think that heavy training in the ranger camp is what did it to me, that uh, we were in for something big, and you kind of have in your own mind that, um, that um, something is going to happen to you. You're either going to be wounded or killed or something. Um, and for many, many, many months after the war, uh, I'd do 75 push-ups every night to relax the muscles that would jump. I'd get into bed and, and the muscles would just uh, tighten up under an arm and start to jump and so I'd, I'd uh, do the push-ups to kind of, that made me so tired I, I could go to sleep. Tell me why the muscles were jumping, tell me that story. 
Well, I don't know. It just, uh, uh, when, when I went to the Pacific, then I was uh, considered a small boat specialist. In fact, I was training 70 naval officers at Saipan when they dropped the atomic bomb. Okay. And nobody talks to me about the bomb. Um, it saved my life. And the major that was in charge told me to tell all of the guys I was training to make our peace with our family and with our God and everybody because none of us would be alive after the invasion of Japan. And I already had my assignment. It was to lead the third wave to Yokosuka Naval Base on November 1st, 1945. And he said, none of you will live after that. So make, make, uh, make your peace with everybody. <clears throat> so nobody talks to me about the a bomb. Uh, everybody can have their own opinions. That's why we fought, I guess. But um, uh, one, of the, one of the reasons uh, would be that the freedom of speech that we would have, of course. Now, you were the skipper of the Higgins boat, is that what you said? Right. So where were you in the boat? I just walked around anywhere. The coxswain ran it, and the ramp man was in front. And my, my position was to lead the third wave consisting of 15 boats. And we went like a, like a V uh, in a uh, line of geese that would be flying. The first boat, and then the second, and third, and so until we got about oh, 150, maybe 200 yards from shore, and then everybody went on their own and tried to find their own, their own spaces. Now you were the skipper of the whole 15. I was. Uh, so uh, how were you? How were you commanding these other boats that? They they, they just followed behind us. And so I. You were at the point of the V. I was at the point of the V. Okay. And then after the after that wave left, then everybody was on their own. Did you, were you aware of any of the boats? I've heard of some men talking about looking over their shoulders and some of the Higgins boats are blown out of the water. Did you see any of that? Tell me. I have, I have uh, pictures of two of the um, Higgins boats that were hung up. <clears throat> they were, the bottoms were blown out by mines and they would then settle down on the tetrahedons that were there. And so um, um, I saw two of them that were like that. Uh, that. That was as many as I saw. Now, if you wouldn't have been, if your boat wasn't destroyed, you probably would have went back and got more soldiers, huh? We would have kept on going, except they were they were ready to give up on Omaha Beach about noon, and they were hoping to <clears throat> not to land any more men, and they were going to take it around. I think Omar Bradley was the one that was going to make the decision, and that's when we first saw the firing of. Uh, what now is so common, the rockets. And they were, they were welded. The rocket boats were uh, like an a, a, um, angle iron welded onto a deck of a, a boat and about a thousand rockets in each boat. But they were like glorified sky rockets that we would know today, but except they had a three-inch shell on the end of them. There was no control of of distance or direction, and they fired about 3,000 of those rockets up into the 352nd Infantry Division, and uh, someplace I, at home I have a picture of uh, several thousand of those men that had given up their walking down the beach to surrender. And uh, I have a good friend who fought he was in the first division and he fought 270 days before he was hit. Finally, he went through the Battle of the Bulge and the whole bit. <clears throat> and um, he says that, he has told me that more men of his men were killed during that rocket barrage. And then at the same time, they brought in destroyers that lined up horizontally to the beach and they opened fire while well, it chased all the Germans back in their in their uh, uh, holes back in the hill and that let our infantrymen the 1st and 29th divisions uh, climb up the hill and so that was uh, 
And I was lying in the water, and I'll never forget, it was the USS Ex uh, Essex. A destroyer came and uh, fired three salvos, and the third salvo hit the steeple of a church, and the, it just crumbled. And it was when we were there in France, uh, back for the 50th, I said to, the, to this French family, I said, someplace there's a church that where the steeple was shown off, was blown off, and they grabbed my arm and pointed to the church, and here at Virville Sumer was the church, and there had been a German spotter in the top of that church steeple all day, and he'd been directing the fire then, which had made it so accurate on Omaha Beach. And that Navy ship knocked it out. And the Navy ship knocked it out, but the fire, the, the shells went right over my head. I was lying in the water at the time. Your story is very intriguing. Um, and I know I'm focusing on the, you guys going to shore and all that. Tell me about the ramp. You said there was a man that lowered the ramp. Was there an order given? Did you tell him to lower it? How did that, how does that work? The, the, the ramp man and the coxswain had done this so many times and had it timed down to the second that they knew exactly when to drop the ramp, except the, on the, the first wave when we went ashore, we hit a couple of sandbars before we were finally uh, close enough to the beach. But we were a long ways. We were at least two, uh, those poor soldiers had to go 150 to 200 yards to make it to the, to the base of Omaha Beach. And this is why they were so exposed, and this is why so many men, men were killed. On, what was the reason for the, was it the tide? Well, it was the tide. There was a 16-foot tide that day, <clears throat> and, the, and we landed during the rising tide so that we could get closer, but being an early wave um, made us that much farther from shore. Hmm. Tell me now, um, so did you see the movie Saving Private Ryan? Yes. Was that a good portrayal of maybe a little bit of what happened? or The first 30 minutes was about as accurate as it could have been. Okay. After that, it was pretty much Hollywood. Yeah, but uh, uh, that's the only part I'm interested in. Yeah. The part. But you thought that was maybe a little bit? I close. thought that was terribly close to the way it was. Yeah, it was a pretty sobering um, bit of film there. Um, Two things were wrong with that film. The first of all, you don't paint the captain's insignia on his helmet because mm -hmm. that makes him really vulnerable to the German sharpshooter. And secondly, they did not show the mines that were on top of the tetrahedons. Were that they, would, they call the hedgehogs? Or? Yeah, or the hedgehogs. And each of them had a mine on top of them that would blow the bottom out of the boat, and it didn't show that in the, in the movie. So, um, uh, what's his name? Um, Spielberg. Steven Sp Spielberg. Steven Spielberg missed the boat on that, but then he wasn't there, so. Well, when I meet him, I'll tell him that. I won't tell him you told me that, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you missed a couple of things. I've, I've interviewed all these veterans, and guess what? Now, <laughs> yeah. now did, you, did you have any reports of what was going on on the beach before you landed with the first two waves? No. Nope. Pretty much wiped out, so nope. you didn't know. We didn't know. When do you think you began realizing that it's not going like it was supposed to? I mean, when you started seeing bodies, or when did you start? Realizing? I think probably when we started seeing bodies. And they were piled that day in the beach like cordwood. Stacked up like cordwood at the end of the day. So. How about... Uh Okay, so you didn't have any contact with what was going on. Don't we had nothing. There's no radio back then. There was no radio. No radio. Contact, no. Yeah, I talked to a gentleman who uh, ran a bulldozer on the beach that day, and he said he helped dig the first cemetery on Omaha Beach because I guess they dug a trench and they just. Yep. That was down. Uh, we've been at that cemetery, and this French family we've met. Uh, every D-Day morning, the mother takes a bouquet of flowers down to where that cemetery was. And they later moved them then uh, to the top of the hill. But uh, um, 
we took ashore men of the 1st and the 29th Division plus UDTs, that's underwater demolition teams, and that turned into being Navy SEALs. And these guys are, were the early heroes, I think, of the, of the uh, uh, invasion. They had 70 pounds of a plastic explosive on their back and they'd reach it back and pull some of that off and put it, slap it on these hedgehogs and put a short fuse on it, a foot or maybe a little longer, two feet, and, and light it and get away as quickly as they could and try to blow up to make room for more small boats with more bulldozers to come in. Mm. You don't hear too much about those guys that did that. Unreal. And I don't know that any of them made it, really. Mm. But UDTs, underwater demolition teams, and we had them, 1st and 29th Division. Were there tanks landing on the beach before infantry? No. There were supposed to have been. 30 or 40 that were supposed to float, but it was so rough that they, they went to the bottom. Amazing. Oh, boy. Have he, has he talked about all this with you? You pretty much know the story. And I saw balloons, and that was uh, hung, that was fastened to the ship with a piece of very thin, small wire, and that was to keep the German Luftwaffe from strafing us because it would cut a wing off and they didn't want to die any sooner than we did. The only thing that the balloons were filled with, is it hydrogen that explodes or oxygen? So. One of the two. Yeah. And so they would, they would shoot tracer bullets and some of them would go through the balloons and they'd explode and come down and catch fire on the ship. So what, they, what the Navy guys did, they each got a wire cutter and went around and clipped the wires on all those balloons and they went flying off to Russia. Oh, <laughs> oh my uh. goodness. I want to ask you one more question that I've been asking all the veterans. Now, you've talked to kids, so you may be a little more familiar with this, but um, you know, I, I believe a lot of the liberties and freedoms that I have today are because you guys sacrificed back then. And you know, what you did back then. There have been wars since World War II, but D-Day was a very pivotal point in our history. So what would you tell the young kids of today regarding how to live their lives in, in, in light of what you did, what was happening, what, you know, what we did at that time against Hitler? How would you tell kids to live their lives today in light of the freedoms that we have? Well, that's a tough question. Think about it for a second. You know, when I hang my flag every day, I think about the veterans that was served in World War II. And, um, but, you know, I, I guess what I'm getting at is, you know, the way society is today versus, you know, what happened back then and what needed to be done. We needed to do what we did. Um, and then you see kids today and, you know, a lot of them don't appreciate things. But that's not all of them, but some of them. But I mean, what would be your message to the young kids today regarding... I think they just have to realize that not all their freedoms are free, that somebody has given, has made a sacrifice. Um, I get all broke up. It's okay, that was well said. Do you got any more to say with that? that I mean, I guess, I guess not. The only thing is that, that somebody has made a sacrifice for them to be able to enjoy their freedoms and that they should appreciate it. Well said. Yeah, ask. Is it taping? I can stop it. Yeah. Stop it? <laughs> no. Around before mm -hmm. for various things and not asking them any questions and not knowing what they've gone through. Mm -hmm. Not just with the war, but with anything. You, you've probably been asked this and I'm sure uh, I probably know your answer, but do you, you consider yourself a hero? No, no way. Just did what I was to do with it that day. And we got cut short in doing what we were doing, and, and so we did the next. The, I guess the only thing I think is that self-preservation gets very strong. That night, uh, Omaha, on Omaha Beach, uh, the, the beach wasn't secure yet. They, the, the English had their, their um, chains that blew up the mines. Mm -hmm. 
But I crawled in, into a burned out LCI, Landing Craft Infantry, with the ramps that went out and came down. And there was a smell in there of burnt flesh. And when I got my night, night eyes, so I could see there were two dead, burned up American soldiers in there. And so I got out of there, because you can't stand the, and I still can smell that flesh after all those, you, you never, never, never forget it. So, um, and I got out of there and I don't remember where, I, I laid on the beach or did something until we were picked up the next day and taken back to a survivor camp. How, how vivid are these memories? Is it kind of like, see I can remember 30 years ago, but we're talking 60 years almost. I mean, is it, is it, are there some things that are just, just like they were yesterday, or are they just real faint in the distance, or are there things you just don't want to remember anymore? I mean, probably there, all of the above. Uh -huh. There, are, uh, I still have some nightmares. Nightmares, yeah. And I'm beaten at her, and and um, in fact, was it two or three years ago down here that I, my sharp scratch toenail scratch on, scratch on her leg, and she was bleeding, and uh -huh. and it almost always is the same. I'm up to my knees in sand. And they're shooting at me and I can't run. And I yell and holler and scream and, and really very, very vocal. <laughs> wake up and in the night physical. and I am ringing wet. You don't remember what you're dreaming about or you do? Remember? Well, I remember the 352nd shooting at us over the, over the top of the hill. So that gets kind of vivid too and, and she's put up with a lot. Well, and I don't want this to, 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 to you know, I, I'm so thankful that you said yes to do this interview, so I don't, I hope, you know, that I'm not adding to any of that. No, but, no. You know, I don't. You probably don't know what lutefisk is. No. Well, anyway, it's a real Norwegian food, and it's, it's fish that's soaked in lye, mm -hmm. and uh, anyway. And then they wash the lye out of it, and you eat it, and, uh, then they cook it, and, and, and it's, uh, and, and, and it's, it's good. Many it's, people told you about this underwear that was yeah. soaked in lye. Soaked in lye, and so we laid in the salt water with that, and the salt water and the lye really gets working, and and my body was like it was on fire. It was just something else again. And so I, I say in this talk that uh, another couple hours I could have been lutefisk, you know? <laughs> that was... <laughs> And that's what they get a kick out of that. Uh, but, um, oh, golly. I think you've covered it. I think you've done good. Well, I'm not going to try to. Try I'm, I'm going to show you a, 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 that piece of shrapnel. Yeah, let's do that now. I've been having a summer cold. Today I thought it was hay fever or allergies. I'm going to just put this down here, but... Okay. Go ahead and tell me what that is. This is a piece of shrapnel from a German 88. And it lit about six inches from my head when we were hit. And... Um, um, I guess on that day somebody was looking out for me. Uh, how did you obtain that? I mean, it was on the deck and the boat was sinking and I reached down and picked it up and put it in the pocket mm. and uh, it laid for 40 years in a drawer back home and uh, never, never, I don't know if I ever looked at it. And all of a sudden then when we moved, we sold our ho home and moved into an apartment mm. and here I found this piece of shrapnel and so that's that's what it is. This is big for shrapnel, but uh, um, I was uh, alongside of the I was alongside of the uh, on the port side of the engine, mm -hmm. and uh, with my head down, and that hit right alongside of my head. That's incredible, huh? That kills people when that hits you. Oh yeah. And six inches more to the left, and it would have it would have taken me. That's the purpose behind those shells, huh? Is to just destroy. They they, they 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 just blow up like that. 
Have the grenades explode in a similar manner? Right, grenades? right. Yeah, they do the same. But they're not this thick, though, grenades. No, they, they wouldn't be that big. But I'm going to, this is, uh, let me just show you. Yes. Um, this is a copy, the original of, the, of Omaha Beach showing and I ripped it out of a out of a uh, a page and threw the rest away okay. and the original to that I've given one more time on the Higgins boat in your in your thought of the Higgins boat and just whatever else you want to say go ahead I just want to say how really wonderful those Higgins boats were made and how well they performed they um, they were concave in the back and convex in the front so you could run up on the beach, throw them in reverse, and it would literally dig a hole that would float the boat. And this is uh, the result of engineers of the British and the uh, Army, the United States Army. But uh, the Higgins boats performed so well and we had so little trouble with the engines and with the boats themselves that I would say thanks to Higgins for building a real fine boat that we could be proud of.